quick reminder that the grace period for homework two ends tonight at midnight. If you need more time, that's fine. The usual thing applies. Just email me and ask for more time. It's just my way to keep people from turning in stuff three or four weeks late every time. Um, today's lecture is more on bootstrapping, and I mean, as I warned you on Monday, or on Wednesday, rather, this is some of the hairier material in the course. In particular, <clears throat> today's lecture is probably going to have involved the hairiest R programming that you're going to see all semester, so don't panic if it's a little bit crazy. It's not going to get any worse than this, and as I said, the homework, it's basically not going to ask you to do much more than repeat the examples in class with a couple minor changes. So recall bootstrapping that if you want to perform inference on a statistic of inference, you need to know the sampling distribution of the statistic. If you want to find a 95% confidence interval for the mean, you need to know the sampling distribution of the sample mean. If you want a 95% confidence interval for the median, you need to know the sampling distribution of the sample median, etc., etc. And for the vast majority of statistics, we don't know the sampling distribution. There's a couple special cases, like the sample mean, we know the sampling distribution from the central limit theorem, but <clears throat> in most cases, we're not going to know the sampling distribution. Well, the only way to approximate the sampling distribution and be able to do confidence intervals p-values for these statistics of entrance is to use bootstrapping. And I could, and there are some universities that actually offer full courses on bootstrapping, so putting this in an intro course is hairy enough already. I'm certainly not going to force you to learn all the intricacies of this, but I wanted to at least give you a brief introduction to the methodology and give you some idea of the types of problems that you can solve using bootstrapping. So the, when you're writing a paper 10 years from now and you want to report a median and a confidence interval for a median, you say, well, I know how to do that. We can use bootstrapping. And, but this isn't intended to make you an, experts, an expert in bootstrapping and know all the methodology. I mean, I quite honestly need to consult my textbooks if I do something other, something that's more complicated than something very simple. So unless you're doing something that's just basically analogous to something I'm showing you in class, I recommend that you email your favorite statistician if you need help with this. I mean, as an aside, and part of the salary support I get for teaching this class, it's with the understanding that if students have statistical questions in their real-world lab work during or after the class, that they can email me. So. Don't hesitate to email me if you're working on a real data set and need some help knowing how to analyze it. So, how do you do bootstrapping in R? Well, I gave, uh, I showed you a simple approach using for loops on Wednesday. Today, I'm going to show a slightly more elegant approach that has certain advantages over the simple approach that I gave on Wednesday but we have to do a little bit of preliminaries. And the bootstrapping libraries are not built into R. You have to install them and load them. The idea is that, I mean, one nice thing about R is that it's open source and hence highly customizable. When people develop new statistical methodologies, they'll write R packages implementing the methodologies, put them on the internet, and then anyone who wants to use the method can download it and run it for their particular problem. That's part of the reason I used it for this class, that the Bioconductor Project is a huge repository of R packages specific for bench science work. but Obviously, if every single program that anybody ever wrote for R got loaded into R all at once, the program would soon be like 500 gigabytes and fill up your entire hard drive. So, by default, when R loads, it only contains the most commonly used packages. 
and if you want to do anything else you have to load some add-on packages and in particular the bootstrapping packages don't even come with the standard R distribution you have to pull them off the internet and install them on your machine so to before you can do bootstrapping in R the first thing you need to do is install the bootstrapping libraries and the way you do that is within R you type install.packages and then in quotation mark boot is the name of the package and it'll ask you where you want to download it from it doesn't really matter which one you choose typically and then it'll download it and you'll probably see some messages like this saying that it's downloading and installing and a bunch of stuff like that so in general, if you say install.packages, install.package package name, that will download a package from the central R repository. Obviously, you need to be on the internet when you do this, and you only need to do this once. Once it's installed on your computer, it's installed on your computer forever, and you won't need to do it again. Do I have a typo here? Oh, yeah, I do have a typo. I'll try to remember to fix that tonight. It just should be install.packages plural, not install.package singular. Sorry about that. And then once the package is installed on your computer, before you use it, you have to give this command library, which basically says take the package from your hard disk and load it into R's memory so the R knows to find the bootstrapping functions. And unlike the install.packages command, you'll have to do, use the library command every time you do bootstrapping in R. The, if you exit out of R and start R up again, you'll need to run this command a second time. One thing that you can do is if you're saving the code to run your program or whatever, just put a library boot at the top of the page so it does it automatically and you don't have to remember. Oh, uh, in general, library package name, it'll load whatever package you specify into memory. You can't use the bootstrapping functions or whatever functions are contained in the package and tell you load it. And you have to do it once per hour session. We won't have to do this frequently in this course. There will be a couple other cases later in this class where you'll need to either install an R package or load an R package in order to run a certain set of code. Oh, now we're going to describe user-defined functions in R that is unfortunately one of the more convoluted things that we'll do. Like I said, I'm giving simple examples and I'll walk you through it and the homework should be relatively straightforward. So, don't get too scared by this. Basically, in R in general, a function, it's a command that'll take data and possibly other parameters at its input, and then it'll give you an output. And we've been using these the entire class, even if you didn't know that you were using functions. So, here's examples of functions. One function is mean. Give it mean 2 colon 6 that says return the mean of the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which is 4. Another function, square root. Ask for the square root of 5, it's about 2.24. Or p norm, if you want the 97.5 percentile, or actually it looks like I probably wanted q norm rather than p norm there, oh well. p norm, that actually gives the probability of observing a test statistic of 0.975 or less under a normal distribution, unlike Q norm, which is probably what I had in mind. But or the sample function is also a function. I tell it to give a sample of length 5 with replacement from the numbers 1 to 10. I get this sample of length 4 with the number 4 repeated twice. So <clears throat> R has built-in functions like mean, square root, sample to do the most commonly used mathematical functions slash statistical functions. But you may want to define your custom function for whatever reason. 
In particular, if you want to use the bootstrapping packages in R, it's basically mandatory that you define your own functions because the boot fu bootstrapping packages in R have a really idiosyncratic syntax that requires that you define a function of a very specific form, as I'll show you here in the upcoming slides. So, how do you define a function in R? The simplest way is to use this command called fix. You say fix and then the name of the function that you want to define. And if anybody has R open, you're welcome to try this, or you can just sort of follow along here. It's one of those things that's relatively easy to see if you try it on your own, but it's a little bit convoluted if you try to just look at it on a series of slides. So let's say we go fix mean dot boo. What happens? Well, when you run the fix command, it will open a text editor and you'll see some text that looks something like this. I was using Linux to create these slides, so I get a funky Linux text editor. If you're using Windows, I think it just opens Notepad. If you're using Mac, I'm not 100% sure what it opens. I think just the Mac text at it, but one way or another it'll give you a text editor. And it works just like Notepad or any other text editor. You just type in your function and then save it when you're done, and then the function will be defined in R. So you get a little screen that looks like this. How should we define our mean.boot function? Well, when you're doing bootstrapping in R, typically you'll define a function that looks like this. You will always a bootstrapping function in R will always or virtually always take two arguments. The first argument will be a set of data. The second argument will be a set of indices. And I know this looks really bizarre. I'll try to explain it in the upcoming slides. But typically what you will do is define a vector x dot star to be x square brackets of i. What does this do? Well, Recall when you bootstrap, you're, you resample from the data with replacement. And basically, this vector i gives you the indices of the data points that you're resampling from. So if you say you had a vector of length 5 and you resampled with replacement, the numbers you got were 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, for instance. In other words, 1 twice, 2 one time, 3 one time, 4 0 times, 5 one times, for instance. If you say x dot star equals x in square brackets of i, that says create a copy of x with the first element repeated twice, the third element repeated once, the fourth element, or, or the second element repeated once, third element repeated once, the fifth element repeated once, sort of thing. It's just basically the same thing that we did on Wednesday only it's in the form of this function. And then once we have this x dot star function defined, we return the mean of that particular, of that vector x star. In our, this, when you define a function, this return tells, basically tells R the value that the function should return. I know this is a little bit goofy. Hopefully it will become a little bit more clear after you see the next slide. So we define our mean by dot boot function like that. So I think I already said most of this. We define a function mean by dot boot that takes two values x and i. x is the data. i contains the indices of the values for which we'll take the mean and it returns the mean of the values of x that are contained in i. And a couple examples on the upcoming slide. So, let's say that our data consists of the numbers 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and I pass it to this function mean.boo. The first set of indices that I give it are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in other words, I, it takes element 1, element 2, element 3, element 4, element 5. It gives exactly the same as the original data. In this case, mean.boot says take the mean of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. It's, of course, 6. Now we do it slightly differently. We say mean.boot 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, but the vector of indices we give are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. 
that says take the first element, the first element, the first element, the first element, just take the first element five times. So, in other words, it says return the mean of two repeated five times, which is, of course, two. So, next example, let's say that we tell it return the mean dot boot of the same vector, but the vector of indices is one, three, one, three, one. So, we take the first element, two, second element, six, then two, then six, then two. So, it returns the mean of two plus six plus two plus six plus two divided by 5 is, of course, 3.6. Or, in general, if we just want to return mean.boot with some arbitrary sample from 1 to 5 with replacement, we try that. In this particular case, it gives us 8. Obviously, each time you run this, you'll get a slightly different mean.boot, but that's the way this function works. That basically, it will return the mean of a sample of your data that's sampled with replacement where the indices that are repeated are specified by the second argument. Does that make sense? Kind of. If it doesn't make perfect sense, like I said, for the homework, you can just basically copy what I did on these slides without necessarily understanding what it's doing. So I know this is a bit complicated. So how do you do bootstrapping in R? Well, the standard function to do bootstrapping is just called boot. First, I attach the lobe lolly pine data. And I'm assuming that I've already loaded the bootstrapping library at this point. So I say height.boot equals boot. And then the first argument is the data. In this case, it's the height data, the heights of these various pine trees. The second argument is this function that I just defined, mean.boot. And the final argument is the number of bootstrap iterations. Most of the time, if you do around 1,000, that's sufficient. It will, R will sometimes warn you if you don't have enough bootstrap iterations, but unless you're doing strange problems, usually 1,000 is more than enough. And if you have a reasonably modern computer, this shouldn't take more than a couple seconds in R in most cases. So, as I said, if you go, in general, the syntax is boot and data x, a function boot.stat, and a number of repetitions b. x is your is the data that you want to bootstrap, and B is the number of bootstrap replicants. And boot.stat has to be a function that takes two arguments, where the first argument is data, and the second argument is indices of the things you want to resample. That's the reason we define mean.boot the way we did, because the boot function in R requires that the the, the function that you give to it be of that particular form. So now let's say we want to use we want to use bootstrapping to find confidence intervals for the low poly pine data. Well simplest command for that is this function called boot.ci. So recall in the previous slide I saved the output of the boot function in this variable called height.boot. If I want bootstrap confidence intervals, I can say boot.ci height.boot, and it will give you, confusingly enough, four different sets of confidence intervals. And, yeah, you're probably wondering what the heck's the difference, which one do I use? Well, the good news, as you can see in this slide, most of the time it doesn't really matter. They all give approximately the same numbers. The rule of thumb, the differences between these various confidence intervals are really subtle, and I could spend two lectures just explaining how they're calculated, and it would just confuse everyone. I don't want to torture you with that. For the purposes of this class, I would say the following, that if, when in doubt, use BCA confidence intervals, they're usually the best for various reasons that I won't go into in this class. The one drawback to the BCA confidence intervals is sometimes if you have strange data sets that are badly skewed or something, 
you'll need a ton of bootstrap replicates to get decent BCA confidence intervals. And when that happens, R will give you a warning message. Usually it'll say something like, warning, BCA confidence intervals may be unstable or something like, or something to that effect. If it gives you that warning, then just use percentile. The percentile intervals are basically what I showed you on Wednesday, where you just create the 1,000 bootstrap replicates and take like the 2.5%, 97.5% quantiles of the bootstrap sampling distribution. That's the percentile interval. BCA is basically a modification of the percentile intervals. You can show that under some conditions the percentile intervals will give you inaccurate results. BCA tries to correct for that, but yeah, that's as much as I really want to say about that because torturing you with bootstrapping was cruel enough, much less all the theory behind it. But in general, if the, you use the function boot.ci of a boot object where a boot object is output from the boot function, if for some reason you want a confidence interval other than 95%, you can use the command boot.ci and then add this parameter conf equals 0.99 or whatever comp level, confidence level you want. As I said before, in practice, pretty much everyone always reports 95% confidence intervals, so you won't commonly use it. But Generally speaking, the bootstrap, the BCA interval is considered to be the best unless it gives you a warning that it's unstable. But the vast majority of the time, it's going to make very little difference. So, if you're ever in doubt, you're welcome to shoot me an email or a statistician who's experienced with bootstrapping. So let's go back to the low wall pine example again. Say we want to find confidence intervals for the median. Well, we can define a function median.boot just like we did mean.boot. If we go fix median.boot, define a function that's pretty much identical to what we did for mean.boot. The only difference is that rather than returning the mean of x dot star, we tell R to return the median of x dot star. So, yeah, this basic function template will be sufficient to solve 80 to 90 percent of the homework problems in this class. So if you can basically copy this function and replace mean or median with whatever I'm asking you to find confidence intervals for, you've pretty much got bootstrapping as far as this class is concerned. So, then we do the same thing before we go height.median.boot, create a thousand bootstrap replicates for height, and then to get a 95% confidence interval for the median height of these little bally pine trees, we can just go boot.ci, height.median.boot, and I mean, once again, you can see there's very little difference in the various confidence intervals. I mean, you will note that in this case, the normal confidence interval is a little bit wider than the other confidence intervals. As its name implies, it assumes a bit of normality in the data, and we saw that the sampling distribution of the median in this case was highly non-normal. Hence, you end up with conservative confidence intervals, which is a reason that people say that it's generally better to use percentile or BCA or ideally BCA, but like I say, I mean, I sure as heck am not going to be taking off large numbers of points like, you reported the percentile interval rather than BCA? What's up with you? No, I'm, we're not going to be that picky in this class. Just putting us on the homework is cruel enough already. So, a slightly more complicated example, remember our clinical trial example that we've used a couple times that we're testing out a new pain medication and we want to see if the new drug provides more pain relief than a placebo. So, there were 75 out of 125 patients 
who, in the treatment group who experienced pain relief versus 52 out of 122 who got the placebo. We want to know if the new drug provides greater pain relief than a placebo. So, or more specifically, just to give an example of the cool things that you can do with bootstrapping that you can't do very easy with conventional statistics is we is to calculate a 95 percent confidence interval for the relative risk and for some reason when I prepared these slides I decided to calculate the relative risk of pain relief which is sort of counterintuitive I probably should have said the relative risk of having pain in the control group but I guess when it comes down to it that's the same thing but Whatever. The point is to show that using bootstrapping you can calculate confidence intervals for the relative risk, which in this case is just the probability of pain relief in the treatment group divided by the probability of pain relief in the control group. So how do we find a 95% confidence interval for this relative risk? And then test the null hypothesis the relative risk is 1. In other words, that the treatment group is no, the, the experimental drug is no better than a placebo. Um, you can do a bootstrap estimate of the relative risk as follows, that basically we'll sample 125 cases with replacement, then sample 122 controls with replacement, and for each bootstrap sample will calculate the relative risk of experiencing pain relief and then we'll have a bootstrap estimate of the sampling distribution of the relative risk. Yeah. We can use this information to <clears throat> we can use this information to calculate a confidence interval. So how would you do this in R? Well, first thing I do is I just kind of define an artificial data set that basically I define two new variables, clintrial.x, clintrial.y. clintrial.x is whether or not they experience pain relief. clintrial.y is whether they're in the treatment group or the control group. Well, I probably should have said treatment, comma, control, rather than case, comma, control, but oh well. So, clintrial.y, so I say there's 125 in the treatment group, followed by 122 in the control group, hence the reason I repeat case 125 times, then repeat control 122 times. And then, in the outcomes, among the first 125 people in the treatment group, I say the first 75 experienced pain relief, the last 50 didn't. Then in the control group, I say the first 52 experienced pain relief, the final 70 didn't. The fact that I put the people experiencing pain relief first makes no difference whatsoever. The point, the important point, is that there are 75 who experienced pain relief in the treatment group and 52 who experienced pain relief from the control group. So, yeah, I think I basically went over this. Clintrial.x has one element corresponding to each patient. We have under the first 125 are cases, the last 122 are controls. If a patient experiences pain relief, they get a 1, otherwise they get a 0. And clintrial.y tracks what the corresponding element of clintrial.x is a case or a control. So now we define the bootstrap function to calculate the relative risk and since I've defined it to be ones if they experience pain relief and zeros if they don't experience pain relief, I define the bootstrap function as follows that I say in this case, I'm assuming that the first 125 are in the treatment group, the final 122 are in the control group. So I say, to take the sum of the first 125 people, that is the count of the number of people who experience pain relief in the treatment group, 
divide by the number of people in the treatment group. Likewise, I can take account of the number of people in the control group, divide by the number of people in the control group, then take the ratio of those two things that gives me the relative risk of pain relief, as it were. And, of course, the first step, I replace x star with x with x dot star according to the indices from the bootstrap sample. So, I think I basically explained this as well. We assume that the first 125 elements of x dot star are resampled from the treatment group. The last 122 are resampled from the controls. So, you can get the bootstrap estimate of the relative risk by taking the sum of the first 125 divided by 125, the sum of the final 122 divided by 122, then take the ratio of those two ratios, basically. And since we just coded those with pain relief as 1 and those without pain relief as 0, you can count the number of patients with pain relief by just summing the appropriate subset of the factor. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll notice a, one potential problem with this function, this bootstrap function to compute the relative risk. It only works if the first 125 elements of the vector are in the treatment group and the final 122 elements of the vector are in the control group. But by default, if you use the bootstrap function, it will resample the entire data set. There's no guarantee that the first 125 people will be in the treatment group and the final 122 people will be in the control group. In fact, if you resample the full data set, we probably won't get exactly 125 people in the treatment group in the first place. So, we need to basically tell R, resample 125 people in the treatment group with replacement, and then resample 122 people from the control group with replacement, and then divide those two, but don't resample across the two groups, if that makes sense. So, the way that you do this in R is to do what's called stratified bootstrapping, which tells R to do what I just described, that you say, take the 125 people in the treatment group, resample from them with replacement. Take the 122 in the control group, resample from them with replacement. But don't mix the two together at all. And this is useful in two sample problems if you want to compare one group to the other group and resample from each group separately, but you don't want to mix the two together. So the way that you do that in R is you add an additional parameter to the boot function where you say strata equals clintrial.y. Recall that we define clintrial.y to be case repeated 125 and then control repeated 122 times is basically so it's a factor with two possible levels. This tells R R is smart enough to see okay this is a factor as two possible levels so we'll resample from the first level, resample from the second level but do the resampling separately within each strata don't resample from the full data set. So we do that, we end up with a confidence interval for the relative risk that goes from about 1.121 to 1.789. Note that the 95% confidence interval doesn't contain 1. So if we can reject the null hypothesis, the relative risk is equal to 1 in this case at the p equals 0.05 level, <coughs> implying that this medicine is in fact effective for relieving pain. Oh, in general, if you go boot x, boot stat b, and then say strat equals y, that'll do stratified bootstrapping. The variable y defines your strata. The bootstrap will be performed separately on each stratum, will not mix samples across the various strata.
And in this case, it tells R to resample 125 people from the treatment group with replacement and 122 from the control group with replacement, but no, without oh, resampling across the two groups. So, general comments on bootstrapping. I mean, if you haven't realized this already, the bootstrapping is an incredibly powerful method that, in theory, if you're really good at bootstrapping, almost the rest of this course becomes totally irrelevant. You don't need to memorize all of these different tests for normality or chi-square tests or this, that, and the other. In theory, you can just bootstrap everything that we have another test for and it'll give you the right answer. And you can also apply bootstrapping to stuff that we don't have tests for, like confidence intervals for the median, and you'll still get the right answer. So, it's sufficiently powerful and sufficiently important that I thought it was worth mentioning in this class. The downside, if you haven't figured it out for the last two lectures, it is not the funnest thing in the world to implement in R. So, <clears throat> if you need to use bootstrapping for a paper that you're writing, shoot me an email, shoot some other statistician email, say, hey, I want to use bootstrapping, I'm not sure how to implement it. This is complicated stuff, but sufficiently powerful stuff, and in my opinion, badly underused method in the scientific literature that there are a lot of things that can be done with bootstrapping that people should be doing, but just nobody does because nobody got taught it, so hence the reason I teach it. So, things to remember for today is you can calculate confidence intervals for just about any statistic of interest imaginable using bootstrapping if you want confidence intervals for median, standard deviation, relative risk, odds ratio, correlation, you name it, you can use bootstrapping to get confidence intervals. Well, except there are some cases where bootstrapping blows up, but in general, it's far more versatile than most conventional methods. And to do bootstrapping in R, you need to define the appropriate bootstrap function, which is tricky for more complicated statistics. I mean, I deliberately gave some fairly simple examples here, but much more complicated examples are possible. And if you need help, just ask for it. And if in two sample situations, like you're trying to compare cases to controls using some test statistic, it may be useful to do stratified bootstrapping and resample separately from cases and controls. And new R functions for today. If you go install.packages, that'll install a new R package on your computer. To do the bootstrapping homework, you'll need to install the boot function. There are a couple other packages that you may need to install later in this course. Once you've installed the package, you need to load it into your R section session using the library command, and if to define your own functions in R, you can use the fix command. To do bootstrapping in R, you can use the boot command, and boot.ci gives you confidence intervals, and the, and you can also tell R to do stratified bootstrapping. Any questions on anything today? Okay. I guess I'll put in one more plug for the discussion section. Thus far, attendance has been, well, I don't think anybody's ever come to it yet, to tell the truth. Which, we have to keep doing it because Erica needs credit, has to at least pretend to teach it to get credit for her class. And I mean, I understand that people are busy, but we are trying to make R as non-painful for everyone as possible, and that's the reason we offer it. So if you're having R problems and you can make it, the resource is there. And I mean, if you can't make it, you're welcome to email either Eric or I or set up another time to go over this. We really try not to torture people with R any more than absolutely necessary.